Well, hello again. Welcome into another edition of Interrupting Racism. My name is Brian Prowitz, the host and founder of this uh, platform in the wake of all of the social issues that we've been seeing in the news and certainly in social media. I wanted to have a platform where we could talk to people, leaders in the state of Oregon, talk about some of the issues that you see all the time, may have opinions about, but may not have heard information from a different point of view from somebody who maybe has a different experience or life ex experience or uh, ethnic background or uh, anything that would make their life different than yours and that we can learn from because goodness knows there's not enough good conversation happening out there on social media from other points of view. So many opinions right now are being made in a vacuum and we try to break through that here on Interrupting Racism. This is not officially an ALF Oregon project, but ALF Oregon really impacted me greatly. ALF is American Leadership Forum of Oregon, and we want to direct you uh, to ALF for more information on uh, what ALF is, how a um, fellow like me can wind up in a classroom for a year with 19 other people that have very different experiences than I do and the impact that can have on a person's life. Uh, it, it is a spectacular program. It's one that I recommend to my friends and I'd love it if you would learn more about alforegon.org and check them out online. And before we get uh, into our interview today, we also have a website for supporting this program and it's called speakupwithus.com. And at that site, we sell t-shirts uh, with phrases like the one you see in the top right corner, interrupt racism and a few other little anecdotes that I picked up along the way from friends of mine who are uh, people of color who have in, just had a major impact on my life. These shirts uh, could potentially spark conversations, hopefully friendly ones, without you even having to say a single word with the goal of us interrupting racism, because I think interruptions just about the most rude thing a person can do to another one. So we want to interrupt racism and make this place a better place for everyone, for all people, for all. We're going to welcome to the program today, Sayadam Edmo. She is the executive director of MRG Foundation. And every single time I say your name out loud, Sayadam, I always think, is it Say Autumn or Sea Autumn? So that's my first question. <laughs> it's Sea Autumn. Uh, sea Autumn, thank you. I just don't want to say it wrong. I called my wife the wrong name our entire first date, okay? And so I don't want to go through <laughs> the whole entire time saying your name wrong. Uh, we've had several conversations, and so you would think that I would have probably figured that out by now. But your name is very unique. I want to talk to you, first of all, um, uh, You, when you introduce yourself, you mention your background, your, your tribal heritage in your name. So uh, first of all, how do you introduce yourself? Tell us a little bit about your background. Sure. Um well, again, my name is Siadam Edmo. Uh, I'm Shoshone Bananas person Yakima, um, but I think more accurately, um, my people are from uh, a village um, called Celilo, about 90 miles east of where I currently live in Gresham, Oregon. Um, I use she, her pronouns, uh, and I work at MRG. Okay, and Celilo is famous because that's where um, massive waterfalls were where uh, we there are pictures occasionally when you when you look around if you study it you can see that there were great falls right there that got basically flooded and, and wiped out by the invention and addition of dams on the columbia river which uh had a massive impact and still does today on culture and heritage and everything right yeah for sure um, so the flooding of the village happened on December 10th, 1957. Um, my dad was 11 years old, um, lived at the village with uh, his um, family. And yeah, I think it impacted all of us um, in, I think, in ways that, um, you know, first and foremost, I, a lot of people lost their, their way of life and the um, there was, um, even though a lot of people still practice, um, you know, the culture and religion, um, seven drum ceremonies, um, I, I think there was a long and still ongoing period of uh, mourning. Um, it's almost like losing um, 
a relative um, losing the falls was. And uh, it's one of the oldest known settlements in all of the West. Um, before um, white settlers came, it was uh, a place that was known region-wide. Tribes would come up from you know, California, down from Alaska, you could see, you know, evidence of trading happening from in, you know, the inner parts of the plains um, into Celilo. And uh, yeah, so I think it, not just for the people um, of the village, but um, for native people all over. 1957 was not long ago. No, <laughs> yeah. At all. So for those of us like myself, I'm almost I'm almost 50 and I, I probably didn't even know about the existence of Celilo until, um, I don't know, maybe 10 or 15 years ago. And, and we tend to think that the way things are is how they've always been. Well, some of us do. And that just is not that long ago. And I didn't even realize... 1957 uh, is the year that that took place. So um, uh, history, I feel like in conversations, I think like the one we're going to have today, history begins to sort of bend. There's an accordion effect depending on your awareness of of history. And for me, my my awareness of history doesn't go back very far. And everything seems everything else that's happened seemed like it was forever ago. But in the big span of the history of indigenous people, 1957 is two seconds ago. Right. It right. just happened. It just happened. So um, uh, I feel like almost saying hello and welcome to the program and thank you for your time. We kind of jumped into like one of the biggest things right off the bat. Um, tell me about your role at MRG. What is MRG? And tell me about uh, your role as executive director. Sure. Um, MRG Foundation was established in 1976, which fun fact is also the year I was born, um, and uh, was established to fund um, social, racial, economic, environmental, gender, and disability justice. Um, that's all we fund and all we have funded um, for our entire 45 year history. Um, so, uh, and we're also um, what's called an operating foundation or a fundraising foundation. So we don't have, um, you know, many foundations uh, have uh, endowments that they hold um, that they, you know, pay for operations and also grant making out of. And we don't have that. We have our board designated endowment is about uh, 5.2 million, which gives us about 200,000 to work with a year, which does not, it's not enough to pay our staff. Um, uh, and uh, certainly not enough to pay for our grant making. But we really believe, and, and the founders believed, in um, not only moving money to the movement, but also shifting power and decision making. So that's one thing that has made that makes us unique, um, that has made us unique over the years. We don't have a board of directors that kind of sits up on high and is full of you know, folks who come from wealth making decisions. We have activist organizers making decisions about where money should flow um, and is really kind of central and core to how we run and have run um, over the last 45 years. So we have a separate group of activist organizer grant makers um, that make all the decisions about how, um, how money goes out the door and what is funded. And I think in many ways, it's what's made us the most effective at um, getting to the heart of social change because um, and funding so social change that matters um, because it's the people on the ground making the decisions, you know, folks who have experienced the pain of injustice, um, making the decision about where investments should go. Um, we were, before I, I, I didn't think I knew MRG when I came into this position um, two and a half years ago. Um, but what I did, I made it my, um, I'm really interested in, you know, in history and in institutional history um, and, you know, kind of unearthing stories um, that, you know, may have been hidden. Um, so I made it my job to, to review every single um, annual report since our inception and, um, and read them all. And what I found, um, ironically, was 
Um, MRG uh, funded a little organization that existed maybe 10 miles from here called AMPO. And AMPO is a cultural preservation organization for native folks and they did um, sweat lodge ceremonies and, um, and uh, in 1977, they were a grantee of MRG. AMPO was also the first place that I sweat when I was one year old. And it's, it was um, really moving for me to find that really, you know, just that singular point. But then later on, I went to an Indian education camp um, and that camp was an MRG grantee. The first board that I ever joined was Columbia Riverkeeper. The first, and and they have within um, their organizational DNA, um, part of it is that they um, do their work in ways that respect and uphold tribal sovereignty, that that was one of their core values as an organization. Um, so from, you know, my very first sweat to early education to my professional career, I feel like a lot of what I have, you know, done in life has been completely informed. Um, and I've been a beneficiary of MRG, which I interestingly, you know, just didn't know um, coming in. And I don't think that my story is unique. I think there are probably hundreds of folks um, who grew up in Oregon, who are from poor communities, marginalized communities, um, who have been the beneficiary of MRG grants. And um, we're often um, first funders of, of ideas and organizations um, that a lot of other status quo funders, um, I'll call them, uh, won't take a chance on. And um, because they might not think that they'll work or maybe they you know, push a political boundary that they're not willing to push or a social boundary that they're not willing to push. Um, and so status quo funders don't fund them, but those are the things that I think our, our grant makers are most excited about. Um, it's kind of the you know, forward thinking, future focused um, visionary work um, that is happening by organizers across the state. MRG stands for McKinsey River Gathering Foundation. What is the significance of that? And are you in Eugene? Um, we are not in Eugene. And look, who is this McKenzie dude anyway? I don't know who that is. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was a beautiful thing. A, a beautiful thing happened on the banks of the McKenzie River 45 years ago. People came together. They redistributed wealth. It was amazing. And that's why the name is what it is. It, it stands for um, Mackenzie River Gathering, the gathering that happened on the banks of that river. Um, you know, but as an indigenous person, when I think about race and institutional memory, right? I, I, it, it is a name that right now, um, and I think in this last year, a lot of us have been unpacking you know, ideas that connect race and institutional memory. Like how do we, and public memory, right? How do we memorialize? And I think you were just talking about like, how do we memorialize history? What do we memorialize in history? And whose history um, do we teach? Um, and do we learn in, um, in uh, public schools, in uh, kind of everywhere that we, you know, kind of gather in information. And so I think over the last year or so, we also at MRG have been wrestling with it because, you know, you kind of go down this rabbit hole of MRG. Okay, so it's not clear what that stands for. It's super not clear what our mission is by just the name. And, and, and so then I have to tell you about whole origin story of what happened. Um, so, you know, it, it's a, it's a thing that we, um, inherit and um, wrestle with, reckon with, uh, as we move um, through life in, in different kinds of institutions. So many people that I know as we have this kind of conversation, so whether a elementary school in town has a name on it or a street or an organization has a name on it that is traced back to um, to a, a, somebody who has been considered a, a hero of history or a pioneer who did these great things and we honor them because of all the work that they've done and 
the names of some of even the towns that we live in. Why is it so important? Why, why do people need to understand the value or the importance of going back and looking at and potentially changing some of those names in order to um, reflect history more accurately? Because people that I'm, I'm around will see whether it's a statue that gets pulled down or a conversation that needs to happen about the name of a school, there's there's obviously pushback. But why is it so important for us to take a look at those and start to look at those things in a more, um, sh shall we say, objective manner? Yeah. I mean, the narrative that we create by what we memorialize or, or um, The narrative that we create um, provides the context for the policy decisions that are going to, you know, the public discourse that's going to happen around important issues about um, about equ equity, about um, public investments. What do we do with our commonwealth, whether that's at the city level, at the county level, or or statewide? But the the narrative that we create about history. Um, and whose history we teach. Um, and, you know, in particular, I mean, I can't, you're in Roseburg, right? Like, I, I feel like I can't have a conversation with anybody in Roseburg without bringing up the mascot issue. Like, sure. um, so um, I think all of that is the, really lays the groundwork for, um, and, and let me, I mean, if I can, I'd love to share just a couple of quotes to kind of illustrate what I'm what I'm talking about, um, the first one um, is from uh, Brian Clattisby, who's Swinomish. He's um, the former president of the National Congress of American Indians, which is the nation's largest and most representative um, uh, uh, organization that's multi-tribal um, across the United States. And he said he said this about mascots. We want our young people to live proudly as First Americans, while also embracing and being embraced by non-Native America. That's why the mockery of Native celebrations and dress in the name of sportsmanship is not just offensive, but insidious, because it asks us to accept the denigration of our heritage. It erodes our children's sense of self, and that is simply unacceptable. Our children, our Native youth, brilliant, energized, focused, represent our brightest hopes. So that's one. And then another author who, who I follow, um, her name is Dr. Adrienne Keen. Um, she works at Brown University um, on, over on the East Coast. She's a Cherokee scholar um, and she had this to say. Um, How can we expect mainstream support for sovereignty, self-determination, nation building, tribally controlled education, healthcare and jobs when 90% of Americans only view Native people as one-dimensional stereotypes situated in the historic past, or even worse, situated in their imaginations. I argue that we can't. So all of these things, you know, our institutional histories, our um, cities, counties, state, however we talk about the history of our communities, um, whether that's affiliated with a high school or an elementary school um, or, um, or a city name or streets or whatever. Um, I think they call into a particular landscape, call into existence a particular landscape that includes every person or every person from every, people from every different kind of background or it intentionally excludes them or exploits them or erases them in ways that are absolutely, I would say, you know, that are undemocratic, mm -hmm. that are un-American even. Um, and um, I think absolutely it's about, it's about, it's about power ultimately, right? When you control the narrative and the story that we tell ourselves about um, who we might be, and I think that's what you know Brian was getting at with with his quote. Um, I think um, when we use, I mean, there's all sorts of evidence 
Like, look, I mean, I got involved with the Indian mascot issue back in 2012. Um, and uh, as when I was vice president of Oregon Indian Education Association. And it's a tough issue, but also, you know, the story that many people don't know is that um, my husband at the time uh, grew up in Washington, D.C. His dad um, was one of the first staffers for the um, uh, Senate Select Committee on Indian Affairs, um, one of the first graduates of an Indian law program at UCLA, and he went to Washington, D.C. to advocate on behalf of tribes. So my husband grew up in Washington, D.C., and his favorite team was the Redskins. And um, so here I was, you know, I don't have a dog in this fight. I don't really, I didn't think I did, right? I didn't think I did at the time. I'm like, oh my gosh, people and their Indian mascots. Like, I don't, you know, it's so, it, it was equally infuriating and ridiculous that like so many non-Indian people cared about this issue so much. I'm like, really like everything all, all the issues that we face in indian country you care about they care about the one that impacts them the most i mean i just thought it was ridiculous um but then i but then i saw how and i'll be honest it mostly rural communities right my dad grew up in the dells um his mascot was the indians um they used to he's actually literally you know um listed in uh their um oh my gosh you know the little books oh my gosh like the registration or no 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 they're um they're not annual reports <laughs> you put them out in high schools you know they're little um graduation. like the annual like the high school yes. uh annual yeah every year yeah, yeah okay um in all of those you can see him you know wearing a headdress listed literally as the school's mascot mascot casey edmo that's what he was, and it's a tough, you know, it was a, because there, it was the only, if you think about the 50s, right, the 50s um, uh, were a time um, that, that was when he was in high school, um, in middle and high school, he, um, they didn't want Indians around, like, we were right in the middle of the era of termination, right, where tribes in Oregon specifically were being politically targeted and terminated and you see this rise of indian mascots from like the 1920s to the 50s what is that about like if you actually think about it it's about power like we don't want you to exist like more in in no other state in the nation were more indians terminated than in the state of oregon it was a resource grab it was about the timber money and wealth and it was about you know privatizing a, a lot so there was an economic driver for that um, to have Klamath tribes lose, to ha lose their federal status, Cow Creek lose their federal status, Kusayus Lalo or Umqua lose their federal status, Selets use their federal status, Grand Ron use, lose their federal status, and all of the tribes and bands that were under them. Not over 90% of the individual Indians who, um, who belonged to tribes um, that were terminated lived in Oregon. So this, I mean, it's, it's bigger than Roseburg, it's bigger, it's bigger than us, absolutely. But um, the fact that it's still debated, I think is, just speaks to the depth of, I think, um, how this state has uh, not shown up for tribal people. I mean, it's evident in, in kind of the political landscape that we see today. You know, we have 3,000 people in the middle of the state who ceded millions of acres to, um, to the United States and ultimately to, to the what would become Oregon without water to drink for now going on two years. Two years, the Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs has been without clean water to drink. Uh, if that were 3,000 people in Bend, people would be up in arms. That would have been fixed in a matter of weeks. But we're able to, we've created this system, not only political system of like isolation, social isolation or assimilation, um, but we've also created like walls where we think, you know, politically, like, you know, sovereignty is super complicated. I get it. But 
we have to be able to empower communities to um, have the resources that they need to solve their own issues. And we have been starving um, resources, actually exploiting indigenous resources um, so that like literally the tribe cannot pay for the $200 million. Why? Because they ceded all this great land that we, that non-Indian people have created wealth, created empires um, over. And quite frankly, many of them have now created foundations. And it's a super complicated space, you know, as an indigenous woman to work in when you see foundations um, that have been created off of essentially indigenous resources. Um, I did not know about what was happening on the Warm Springs Reservation. And if it wasn't for ALF, I never would have been there. We went the year before the hotel closed to Canada Resort and uh, an incredible, incredible landscape there. And the debate then was whether to um, allow people to have permits to recreate on that, on the reservation there, uh, because there was demand for people to bike and probably drive ATVs and some such. And, and the younger generation was like all for it. And the older generation was like, no, this is, this is it. This is our chunk of land and they can't, they've taken everything else. They got everything else, every, every place else they can recreate to simplify the argument. I'm sure it's right. much deeper than that, yeah. but, um, so I wasn't aware of that. And I can imagine that, that there needs to be resources and infrastructure for uh, people, no matter where they live. And so, yeah, that's, uh, I'd like to know more about that, um, I think. Um, so as you were talking, I was thinking about what it must do to you when you hear people say, especially around the mascot argument, but it could be true with the names of schools and such. Hey, that's where I went. That's what I am. That's how I identify. That's my history. That must, it's a softball to you because I know you hear that a lot. What do you say to people who just, if we use the Roseburg High School mascot, which by the way, I have a close tie to for you. I yelled touchdown Indians for many years doing play by play on the radio and been a shill for Roseburg High School for a long, long time. And, um, and, and so I've heard, for a long time. I celebrated when the Indian mascot was able to stay on the wall at Roseburg High School back in when uh, your I was I think, fighting it. <laughs> you were fighting Jeff Cruz over that. Um, and so, but that's, I think, the biggest argument that we hear back from people who graduated from Roseburg High in 1955 or something saying, hey, I've, I've been a Roseburg Indian my entire life. We do that because we want to honor them, and the, the, the idea and the, and the people. Uh, it just must, that just must smack of just, I don't even know what, how does that hit you though? Um, I think of two things. Um, one, it flies in the face of literally every major like Indian policy advocacy organization or outlet, right? The National Congress of American Indians has been fighting literally the nation's largest and most representative group of tribal nations all coming together has been fighting this for decades. So it flies in the face of national policy um, folks. So that's number one. Like, actually, tribes don't agree with you. The literal tribes. I mean, I think people, you know, are like, oh, yes, my Indian friend says it's fine. And I'm like, well, <laughs> um, of course they said it's fine because they're, you know, we are when folks are um, cornered, right? When they are within an oppressive system and have lived there and um, and someone corners them and says, uh, don't take my fun away. Do you wanna take my fun away? Like, this is fun for me. Like it celebrates everything of who I am, right? Um, and if you say, and we know, we know the implications of asking an individual Indian that question. It, it implies that we're ruining somebody else's fun but like the denigration of our culture and right exactly what adrian keen said right what do we do we exist in only the imagination of non-indian people like that's what that's what is happening um essentially i mean so that's one i'm like you're ignoring actually 
decades of policy and advocacy of tribal nations, you know, nationwide who have spoken out against this issue. So that's one. So you think you're doing us an honor. We're telling you it's not honoring and then you still want it. So here's, you know, in the middle of, I think it was 2013, in the middle of a um, one of the education hearings, it was actually Jeff Cruz who, so I was sharing uh, my dad's yearbook pictures and I had blown them up and laminated them and I was passing them around, um, you know, and, and they took pictures of them, entered them into the public record um, and he refused to pass them. And he threw them down on the desk and he said, these are irrelevant. And I'm like, what are you talking about? And he's like, these are irrelevant. We don't do this anymore. And that in itself, saying that someone else's interpretation of history, their pride, their tradition is the only thing that matters. And our history and experience and is discriminatory in and of itself. Saying my history and tradition matters on this and yours does not is actually discriminatory in and of itself. So that's the other thing I would say is that um, schools in Oregon have an obligation and that you can go to the State Board of Education, find this for yourself, to a socially and psychologically safe learning environment. People talk about free speech all the time and yes, free speech is there, it exists, but our job in Oregon is actually to provide our students with a socially and psychologically safe learning environment. There is there are reams of evidence upon evidence upon evidence that the that the existence of Indian mascots makes it um, not a socially and psychologically safe learning environment for Indian kids. You see that in um, the you see that in how the the mascotry plays out. You know, even though schools put in all these rules, like really, you know, you know, you can't say you know, what happened in Oklahoma, like what happened in Oklahoma, like we're gonna send you on the trail of tears part two. And don't get me wrong, like there, I think, you know, there's the bad actor argument. Oh no, that's just a group of whatever, like getting away with something. No, we are willfully creating, <laughs> like by using a, by using a group that is, um, that is a part of our communities and making them, like we are actually, we are providing we are providing all the tools for discriminatory acts to be um, uh, to be taking place within our schools by even having Indian mascots around. Never mind the so social and again, like this is not an aside, but like beyond in addition to the socially and psychological impact, social and psychological impacts to Indian children. Um, but yeah, it is uh, it's it, it's asking us to define acceptable levels of discrimination and racism. What is an acceptable level? An acceptable level for our kids should be none. It should be none. And I, I can't disagree with that. How, I, and I, I don't know who can, and yet, you know, some people do, I guess. I, I think, I think maybe if, if the element of native peoples is not the place where people should land for a conversation about this, what about addressing racism in our high schools, among our youth for all, all of us? Like, and, and potentially looking at something like that as, listen, if we would like to commit to improving relations between people of different ethnicities, and if there needs to be a level of understanding about what racism actually is, and does it actually exist? Do you define it as ignorance or is there actual racism going on? If we want to address racism, admit that it exists and admit that maybe some of the people in power could be part of the problem, then this would fall into a category of, okay, well, if, if we wanna fix these things, that, that's one of the first things, but also there's so much work we should have, we should be doing, I think, with our youth on this topic. 
that it would it would make sense to me that the word all, as in all children, would become very important mm -hmm. and be something that motivated whoever is in charge, in power, to address racism in all of its forms beyond, above just a conversation about the impact this is having on indigenous people for the benefit of all of our children. So mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of levels where this could be addressed that right. in some ways could get this conversation away necessarily specifically from the mascot issue, though it needs, I think it still needs to be addressed. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there's, there's a couple of ways that, that this could happen or that the conversation can happen. And I'm not even saying like right now you could take what I just said and decide that I'm calling out the Roseburg school district or something or the school board. And I'm, and I'm not, they know where I stand by the way on, on the Indian mascot. Uh, I situation. am. Cause you I communicate. Not. You are, you yeah, are. I what I'm doing is I would love to call out the school district and the school board just to address the the racism that exists in the school and in just by nature, because I've heard stories from our black and brown friends about what they experienced. And, and right. in some cases, not even it could be white kids that are having some sort of an issue that that put, could come back to some sort of uh, uh, racist thoughts. So there's a lot there, I think. Yeah, absolutely. And I know you are. And when you normalize, right, when you normalize um, stereotyping a group or treating a group differently, kids are smart. They know that you're normalizing that, right? And so, you know, there's not only, right, the impact to Indian children, but other marginalized children um, in schools, right? So kids are not dumb. They pick right. up, oh, it's okay to it's okay to stereotype and it's okay to make mockery of, of a particular group or have like acceptable levels of, you know, um, mockery or stereotyping and, um, and there, and then have it like evolve to something that's more socially palpable. Right. Well, like embrace it is also a way of, um, uh, of reifying the history of the impact of that Indian mascot on people, of like almost lifting it up and saying, this was okay, and so we're gonna keep it, right? And so I think that's also a danger um, when you have a school with a long history of a mascot is that you you make other things acceptable. Um, yeah, and where's the zero tolerance element to that, right? How much of it is tolerable? What? Where's the line? And some of it's okay, but not all of it. And I'll tell you, the, the biggest impact I believe Alf had on me was the moment when a black woman in my class said that she was afraid to come to Roseburg. Like she was taught not to stop in Roseburg as a black woman. It was not safe for her to come to my town. Mm -hmm. <laughs> my opinion on racism at that point stopped was irrelevant like it was irrelevant because her and you can argue why did she who taught her that where yeah, did that you can come problematize from? the victim all over the place yes absolutely. but it came down to the fact that in her world that was that was the line well i don't i cannot have an opinion about her experience how could i possibly and and so i i put that back to you in this discussion of our uh, uh, Native American population, indigenous people here, if 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 you see it as harmful and, and racist, it needs to be addressed. Like our opinion on it no longer matters because you're the person impacted by it. And to make an argument that I'm impacted by that mascot because I have pride in being a Roseburg Indian, it, it, it just to me, it, it does fall flat. And now I'm making it pretty clear on my stance on <laughs> what's happening with this. But I wish I, I wish more people would understand it that way, that that is your opinion on racism. And if you're not affected by it, first of all, it's privilege. Second of all, maybe talk to somebody who is impacted by it and get past the crazy Facebook 
stuff that happens and, and go talk to somebody and ask them what it's like to be you. Like, well, how does this impact you? Please explain it to me and then listen. Maybe, although I think there can be a power imbalance there. I wouldn't suggest that actually. And I wouldn't, I would not um, coach any of my friends to get into a debate with, you know, someone who's a, a mascot proponent, an Indian mascot proponent. You Why? know, it's putting our, because it's putting ourselves at risk. Like, so OIEA organization that I was in, you know, um, uh, president of for a time, um, the the leadership committee before ours that took on this issue received debt threats from people who loved their Indian mascots and did not want us to take up this issue. We were the first state to go for an all in all out ban. Um, there were no, you know, tribal provisions for, um, uh, and it it made, you know, it made front page news, um, it, because it was the day after signing die, um, right? So the legislature has had just wrapped, and when ODE said we're taking this issue up, no other issue in the history of the Department of Education in Oregon has ever gotten as many public comments as the Indian mascot issue did no other issue before or since it was a record and it just speaks to to me at least you know it it was very you know this whole narrative about um honoring and you know paying homage like that all goes to the kind of you know you had people talking about you know, we're almost dead and whatever. And I'm like, what is this even like, that's a part of it. Killing us is a part of the narrative. Like, you know, start, like that is a part of the narrative that's like, oh, if we take away the Indian mascots, that's the last Indian thing we'll have. And I'm like, no, it's not. Listen, you can teach Indian history and sovereignty without intentionally creating, you know, a, a you know, discriminatory environment, basically. Um, you don't need to, you don't need to create it to have a teachable moment. You can just talk about um, Indians as a part of history and Indian history. I mean, I'll be clear, like when we were first thinking about the Indian mascot issue, um, our goal wasn't, you know, just to ban Indian mascots. It was the longer trajectory of teaching Indian history and sovereignty in all K through 12 classrooms in Oregon. And that is now the law of the land, right? So we knew we knew that the other side was going to say, um, oh, no, this is uh, like we need to have tribal provisions to um, to um, um, right. Tribes have the right to determine, you know, how they represent their cultural history, like all tribes have that. Right. So there was a deal that was struck between the NCAA and the Florida Seminole, right, the Seminole tribe of Florida. Um, and so you can have a namesake provision, but it has to be a namesake provision. Like one tribe, so Cal mm -hmm. Creek, I don't, I, I elect none of their leaders. They don't speak for me, right? There are kids from all tribal, different tribal backgrounds in Roseburg High School today. All backgrounds, all from all over the country, people who, you know, people whose tribes actually don't agree with that, who are impacted by what happens um, in Roseburg right now. and. Mm -hmm. So to say, to just point to, you know, the local tribe and says, well, the local tribe says this, well, they don't speak for all Indians. Um, and it's a really, you know, it's a very tricky, there's very tricky nuances, but um, it is, I mean, I feel like it's a complicated issue that I know way too much about because honestly, I mean, it's up until, you know, up until 2012, um, there were nine Redskins jerseys in our closet. <laughs> like, it's super complicated. Right. And um, I'm not some like, you know, burn the mat. I'm just worried about my kids. Like, I don't want my kids. I had to play against a lot of these schools. I played against the Banks Braves. I played against, I mean, this is where, this is my home state. It's where I grew up. And so I played a lot of these schools and um, it was rough being the only Indian kid sometimes on the, you know, on the field, on the court, in sports, like watching my own culture, like, you know, 
kids whose faces were painted. It just, it was really crappy. And I can't even imagine how my dad felt. I can't even imagine. Um, it's really important that I go back to that, that point of talking to somebody and asking them, what is it like? Please explain to me, what has your life experience been like? And, and whether it's this issue with a, a Native American person or a black person, as you talk to them and say, what is it like to be African American in Roseburg, Oregon, for instance? Mm -hmm. And and what you said is that's not helpful or, or may, let's clarify that. Because I to me, that's how you get to know. understanding. Yeah, I, okay. I wouldn't say sometimes it's helpful. Sometimes it's helpful, but I don't okay. recommend it necessarily to to. I don't want to put my I'm not. This can be such a like if you take someone who's got, you know, really entrenched beliefs about mascots, about whether racism, racism exists or not. I'm not up for debating my humanity. Right. But like that's not. I, I don't want to be in a debate about my own humanity, about how people, you know, that's not my space to learn or teach a, like, a, a, you know, a white person about, like, that's not my job. I don't want to take that on. I, and so that's, and okay. mine is more for like the protection of like people of color who are experiencing this in the community. I think the, if people really cared, if people actually cared about outcomes for kids for families who are folks of color living in any place in Oregon and it doesn't have to be Roseburg I think um going out and educating yourself there's a great you know in particular to the mascot issue right there's a great resource called missing the point it was um by the Center for American Progress that talks about um Indian mascot use in K through 12 schools and why, you know, the major teams like the Washington Redskins and the Cleveland Indians and like are kind of, we're missing the point about what is impacting our kids the most. Like to Brian Cladisby's point, like it's not only unacceptable, it's insidious. It teaches us that like mastery is okay and has been okay. And now we just kind of water it down and it's still okay. Like some, you know, some level of like, stripping away my humanity is okay. And um, I I think becoming a parent, like, you know, I didn't mind it for myself, but we often, I think, are willing to accept situations for ourselves that we would never accept for our kids, right? We get super, we get super, um, right? At least I do. I get super mama bearish about my kids. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, I'm, I'm glad the, the way you explained that I thought was great. You should not have to teach a non-native person and explain it at, when it's kind of like a very, very good friend of mine who after George Floyd, all of a sudden everybody wanted to talk to black men about what it's like to live in a white state and live in a white community and, that gets exhausting and I didn't understand that. And I understand that now. And it's like, okay, you have like, in his case, you have about 400 years of history that you can probably look at and you probably should have seen it by now. Like mm -hmm. if I have to explain this to you at this point, you haven't been paying attention. And the first time that occurred to me, I, I kind of pushed back against that. I resisted that. I fought that. And then I was like, no, that's right. It's exactly right man so i think that falls into this category as well if you if you feel like there are plenty of places that you can educate yourself you said this as well that doesn't involve i guess putting a native person in a position of having to explain their humanity to you i'm very thankful for you saying that because for a long time i've been saying in this program Go talk to somebody who doesn't look like you and ask them what it's like. And I think that can be healthy. I guess if you have the right attitude and you have the right person, maybe you have a friend and your intentions are clear, although intent doesn't always excuse impact. Right. Um, so you're right. It's nuanced. It's very complicated. But uh, my hope is a conversation like this, a program like this, 
will encourage people in my network to go learn more about what we just talked about right here and what some of the other conversations are that we've had. And I only hope that that's happened maybe once or twice since we started doing this. Because I think that's that's so important. So That'd be great. Um, when did, um, so you, it feels like in your story, there was a moment that something changed where you went, maybe, maybe becoming an advocate for your people, for your history became your driving force. Mm -hmm. When, when did that happen? Um, I think uh, in my professional career, I think in uh, it happened um, in 2016, actually, you know, just before um, the election, actually, it was, um, I can even pinpoint uh, the day. Um, I went, uh, we went up the river, my family and I, to, um, to Celilo for first salmon ceremony. And um, I think you know, folks who are folks who are spiritual probably um, this might be a familiar story, but it was um, in that longhouse. I heard um, the person who was conducting the ceremony say one particular thing, and it just hit me. And I came home. I um, I had been working at Lewis and Clark College um, for almost nine and a half years. I came home. I quit. Um, the Human Rights Commission for the City of Portland. I quit the um, Community Oversight Advisory Board that was overseeing um, the Department of Justice settlement with the City of Portland. I quit um, uh, Oregon Indian Education Association. I quit everything. I quit everything. And I said to myself, you know, I'm still at this college by the time I'm 40. It's my own fault. And um, I went directly into um, finding a new job, looking at organizing um, and supporting the communities and causes that I cared about. And that's also the year I joined ALF. That's a lot of stuff all at the same time. I mean, it was- You must, was have, been, a, you must have been really interesting in your ALF class. I, <laughs> it was, a, it was a, have I told you my ALF story? No, I was gonna ask you that, but we got off into more interesting stuff. Okay, well, I'll, um, Not to say I, that your Alf story isn't interesting. <laughs> my, <laughs> Oops. Yeah, it's it's. <laughs> I think so. I've I've shared it um, publicly. I, I always share it because I'm still a, um, an Alf super recruiter. Um, every year, I I always recruit folks. Um, uh, kind of like you, probably. We should like trade notes. Um, but. Um, it's actually really interesting. So um, several years, you know, I thought ALF was like a cult. I think everybody does to a certain extent, you know, when they first yeah. hear about it. Um, but I had two folks um, reach out asking for help on a project that they were, some learning that they were doing around Indian history and sovereignty. And, um, you know, I don't tend to say yes right away. Like um, if I invest my time in things, it's, you know, because I want to do it and I think it's worth doing. Um, and I looked at Elf, I looked at the webpage, I saw some of the leaders, and many of them were people I really admired, um, but one of the names stood out, and that, uh, that was uh, John Haroldson. John is a district attorney um, in Benton County um, in Corvallis, and um, when I saw his name, I knew that this was an organization that I wanted to be a part of, and here's why. Um, in the early 2000s, um, I was a new mom, um, married, living in Corvallis um, with a newborn daughter. And it was the third time that I had called the police to report the domestic violence of my um, then husband. And when the police came, um, John Haroldson uh, showed up with them. And um, I was living in total isolation at the time. Um, and here was this DA who probably had way more important things to do than, um, you know, respond with officers to a house call, um, dropped whatever he was doing um, to come visit me and my daughter. 
and um, he sat me down, we sat down, we had a conversation. Um, he told me that, you know, my daughter, that we deserved a loving home. Um, and he loaned me a book. Um, he said he wanted me to give it back. It was about the cycle of violence. And so it was really an interaction that has informed the rest of my life and how I want to lead. He, you know, at a time when no one was looking, no one else was there. Um, he, um, he displayed profound leadership. And uh, that's when I knew, you know, if, if I were to give anything back to this state, to the world, um, it was gonna be in that same spirit. And um, so uh, I joined um, when, when I was nominated in, in 2016. And um, I don't believe in, you know, this goes for the mascot issue and everything else, but like, I don't believe in tearing down people. And, and I believe in debating ideas and debating solutions and getting to better solutions. Um, uh, there are many people that and issues that I um, am passionate about, but I also see beyond, you know, kind of silos that we traditionally fall in, I think, you know, of Democrat or Republican or rural and urban or whatever they are. And um, I see allies everywhere. And, and also in particular in Roseburg, like I remember when Lone Rock Timber Company like had this deal with, you know, with four of the five Western tribes who were terminated to purchase the Elliott Forest and people on the progressive left raked them over the coals. And it was again, an, an Al senior fellow, Jake Gibbs, um, who uh, from down there, who I, I was like, I love what you're doing. I want to come help. And he was like, what? Okay. So I started writing op-eds. I started testifying in front of the landlord. I'm like, no, this company, you don't get to come here, progressive environmentalists. And I love like environmentalists, like that's my home. You know, I, I was an environmental science major. Like my first jobs were in outdoor education. Like I love this stuff. And my first board was Columbia Riverkeeper. But um, environmentalists had it wrong. They had it completely wrong on that issue. And I wasn't afraid, I was not afraid to, you know, speak out and speak um, and talk about, you know, here was a company trying to do business in ways that not, that, that not only were good for, you know, Cow Creek, uh, but um, Kusa Yusla Lower Umqua was gonna handle the conservation easements. There was gonna be no public access lost. And the progressive left were treating it as if it were like a Cato style, like privatization of land, which it wasn't at all. And, um, you know, I think that's part of what I got from ALF, from being there was like, you know, this, this drive to want to support leaders, people, um, and um, really get to kind of, you know, the heart of a lot of what divides us and, or what we perceive divides us. Um, those are my favorite, right? Um, you know, I hadn't seen, just to go back, I hadn't seen John Haroldson in probably 15, 16 years um, until a week after um, we had an ALF reunion, a week after that, um, he was at, um, the Latino Network Gala because he was in Carmen Rubio's class, who was, um, who was uh, the director at at um, Latino Network at the time, and of course they were grantee of MRG. So I showed up, and and he was there. I had just shared the story I just shared with you on the reunion like stage in front of all of you know all of Alfdom to see, and um, there he was a week later, and I was like, oh my gosh, D. A. Haroldson. Like you changed my life. I went into Alf. Alf changed my life. Um, and I sent him. I sent him that. I mean, he, of course, remembered who I am. I didn't know that he would, but um, we keep in touch now, which is, I feel like, amazing. Um, 
so yeah that's my elf yeah yeah and what class were you 31 30 wonderful that's right <laughs> that's right every elf class thinks that they were the best 30 fire i was class 34 30 fire so we were the best class it's true uh 30 wonderful close second i'm sure um <laughs> well we can debate that later um i just uh just want to thank you for your time um I knew that we would talk about a couple of those issues, but I didn't. I didn't know I would learn as much as I did, and um, I just appreciate how uh, honest you've been and just you know willing to share your stuff. I, uh, it's been good. Thank you. Thanks for having it's me. It's been good. And also uh, for basically correcting or gently doing so on one of my big theories that. You know, going and talking to somebody and and trying to understand them a little bit more. Good conversation is important. It's still a good thing, but there is some nuance there. You have to be aware of um, the way your your questions potentially can impact somebody, even if your intent is good, which is another thing I've learned uh, in my elf time. So, anyway, any any last uh, thoughts you want to leave us with? Anything that we that we you want to say that we didn't touch on? We covered a lot of ground. Oh my gosh. So many things I want to say. I didn't even talk about work. Um, I will say this. Um, one of the teachings um, that I always fall back on um, is uh, my um, uncle, Larry uh, Mario, is, um, I mean, he's super smart. He's got his PhD and blah, blah, blah. But the thing that he is always saying to younger folks is your words are your prayers. Your words are your prayers for the kind of world that you want to manifest into existence. And, um, and for folks, listeners out there, um, you know, on their pathway, on their journey to learning about um, uh, racism, institutional, structural racism that impacts people, um, your words are your prayers, you know, whether they're um, on Facebook or, you know, wherever they are in policy, um, in, in how we kind of build and rebuild our communities. Um, so choose them carefully. I like that a lot. Um... Usually when I go home, I tell my family is kind of stuff I've done today and we tell stories. Um, uh, that'll be one that I share with them. I think that's really powerful. I do. Um, I'm going to sell Alf for another minute or two here, but I wanted to thank you once again for the time. I look forward to the next chance we have to talk. Um, you have a friend in Roseburg. You can call me anytime, talk about whatever's going on. And, uh, I'll do the same when, uh, then that's the elf network. That's how cool it is because you can call somebody up that you don't really, you can call a complete stranger up that's in the elf network and you'll immediately have a connection because you'll know some stuff, some similar stuff as, as somebody else. It's pretty cool. So Absolutely. I'm sure you have uh, lots of important work to get to. So I will let you do that. And I want to thank you again for your time. Thank you. So Seattle Medmo, the executive director of MRG Foundation. Yeah, we didn't really talk a whole lot more about it uh, because we got into some of those other conversations. But there's the website, mrgfoundation.org, if you'd like to learn a little bit more or reach out to Seattle. So uh, this is usually something that gets a little bit tricky. We'll see if I can do this correctly and well. I wanted to do a little bit of a plug here for ALF and uh, See, Adam, I'm going to uh, put you back in the green room here real quick, but stand by because I do want to talk to you before you go. Uh, anyway, uh, coming up, Alpha Oregon uh, graduation is coming up on May 21st, so just a few days away. And the reunion gala, I guess that would be this weekend, wouldn't it? Also, uh, some of the other programs, White Leaders for Racial Justice, Nonprofit Leaders Connection Hour, virtual check-in for Alpha Oregon throughout the state June 1st. And yeah, we're introducing classes 37 and 38. And also this is nomination time as well. I'm trying to get back to it. There it is. Uh, if you'd like to know more about getting uh, into ALF or being in one of the next classes, well, now the website's gonna trick me. Uh, please do so there at alforegon.org.
Uh, my name is Brian Prowitz. I'm your host. I appreciate you being here. Thank you for all the comments that come in. You can watch live or if you're one of the people that come in and watch afterwards, um, you can still send me an email through any of the platforms that you're watching. We're on Facebook, YouTube, and now Twitch. And we actually got our first greetings from somebody uh, on Twitch who just basically checked in and then left, but uh, that's cool. So we're just trying to get uh, some uh, more information and good conversations out there into uh, the uh, the uh, blogosphere, if you, I hate that word, but into the ecosystem that is social media and conversations that need to happen. So once again, thank you to our guest today, Seattle Manmo from MRG Foundation. And want to make a plug as well for uh, speakupwithus.com. Go there and get a t-shirt. The uh, revenue from that is in support of the um, uh, Black United Fund of Oregon. And we're happy to support them as well. So again, thanks for your time. We appreciate you being here. I hope that you get the chance to go out and interrupt racism soon. And when you do, let us know about it. And we'll be back again with another program on interrupting racism. Hope you have a good day.